let's look at an introduction to discrete random variables and discrete probability distributions. There are formal mathematical definitions of a random variable, but let's look at an informal definition that may be a little more helpful for us. A random variable is a quantitative variable whose value depends on chance in some way. The meaning of this will become a little clearer as we work through examples. Here's a simple example. Suppose we are about to toss a coin three times, and we let x represent the total number of heads in these three tosses. Then x is a random variable that will take on one of the values 0, 1, 2, or 3. x is a random variable because it is a quantitative variable whose value depends on chance. We don't know what value x will take on until we actually toss the three coins and count the number of heads. But we do know it will take on one of these four possible values, and we can even work out the probabilities of each of these four values occurring. We usually represent random variables with capital letters near the end of the alphabet. Here I used x, but other letters like y and z are commonly used as well. There is an important distinction between discrete random variables and continuous random variables. Here, x is what we call a discrete random variable. Let's take a look at what we mean by that. Discrete random variables can take on a countable number of possible values. This might be a finite number of possible values, as it was in the coin toss example where there were four possible values, or it might be something we call a countably infinite number of possible values. We'll look at more examples in a moment. Continuous random variables can take on any value in an interval of values. Continuous random variables always have an infinite number of possible values corresponding to every value in an interval. For example, a continuous random variable might take on any value between 4 and 6, say. There is an infinity of values between 4 and 6, including 4.267 and 5.894265 with infinite decimal places. There is a continuum of values between 4 and 6, and a random variable that takes on any value between 4 and 6 is a continuous random variable. The distinction between discrete and continuous random variables becomes a little clearer when we look at a few examples. Here are a few examples of discrete random variables. The number of free throws an NBA player makes in his next 20 attempts. What are the possible values this random variable can take on? The player can make 0, 1, 2, up through 20. There are 21 possible values and 21 is certainly a countable number of values. So the number of free throws made is a discrete random variable. How about the number of die rolls needed to get a 3 for the first time? What are the possible values here? We could get the first 3 on the first roll, or on the second roll, or on the third roll, etc. There is no upper bound. This random variable can take on any whole number value that is at least 1. There are an infinite number of possible values of this random variable. We call this a countably infinite number of possible values. So the number of rolls required to get the first three is a discrete random variable. How about the profit in dollars on a $1.50 bet on black and roulette? A bet on black and roulette is an even money proposition. You lose $1.50 if you lose, and you win $1.50 if you win. So the possible values of the profit are minus $1.5, you lose $1.50, and plus $1.5, you win $1.50. There are two possible values, and that is certainly a countable number of possible values, so our profit on that bet is a discrete random variable. Note that some discrete random variables take on negative values, and values with decimals, and they don't necessarily represent a count. But very often, discrete random variables do represent a count. Here are two examples of continuous random variables. The velocity on the next pitch thrown in Major League Baseball. The velocity can be anything between zero and whatever the maximum possible velocity is. The possible values are not just the integer values like 83 miles an hour or 97 miles an hour, but everything in between, like 92.869439875 miles per hour. 
There is a continuum of possible values here, and the velocity of the next pitch is a continuous random variable. The time between lightning strikes is also a continuous random variable. Time, in its nature, is continuous. The time between lightning strikes isn't restricted to integer values like 1 second and 2 seconds and 3 seconds, but everything in between, like 1.78694 seconds. Once again, there is a continuum of possible values, and the time between strikes is a continuous random variable. Variables like height, weight, length, volume, and time are usually continuous. Because of the differences between discrete and continuous random variables, we need to model them a little differently. Every random variable has something we call a probability distribution. There are some important differences between discrete probability distributions and continuous probability distributions. And for the rest of this video, I'm going to discuss discrete probability distributions. We'll look at continuous probability distributions another time. The probability distribution of a discrete random variable x is a listing of all possible values of x and their probabilities of occurring. Let's look at an example. Approximately 60% of full-term newborn babies develop jaundice. Jaundice is a yellowing of the skin and whites of the eyes, and in newborns it's usually a mild, temporary condition. Suppose we randomly sample two full-term newborn babies and we let x represent the number that developed jaundice. Then x is a random variable, and we might wish to know its probability distribution. We could have either 0, 1, or 2 babies with jaundice, so the possible values of x are 0, 1, and 2. Now we need to figure out the probabilities of each of those values occurring. Here are the possible outcomes. I'm letting J represent the event that the baby has jaundice, and N represent the event they do not have jaundice. The first baby selected and the second baby selected could both develop jaundice, in which case X would take on the value 2. The first baby selected could develop jaundice, and the second one not, in which case X takes on the value 1. Or the first could not develop jaundice, and the second one develop it, and X still takes on the value 1. Or they could both not develop jaundice, and x takes on the value 0. Now let's work out the probabilities of those events. The probability a randomly selected full-term newborn develops jaundice is approximately 0.6. And if we're sampling randomly and independently, we can multiply the two probabilities together to get the probability they both occur. So the probability both newborns develop jaundice is 0.6 times 0.6. The probability the first develops jaundice and the second one doesn't is 0.6 times 0.4. The probability the first doesn't and the second does is 0.4 times 0.6. And the probability they both do not have jaundice is 0.4 times 0.4. Now let's summarize that in a table. The random variable x can take on three possible values, 0, 1, and 2. The probability x takes on the value 0 is 0.4 squared, or 0.16. The probability x takes on the value 1 is the sum of these two probabilities, which works out to 0.48. And the probability x takes on the value 2 is 0.6 squared, or 0.36. We've listed out all possible values of x and their probabilities of occurring, and so this is the probability distribution of the random variable x. We can now read probabilities off the table. For example, the probability the random variable x takes on the value 0 is 0.16, which we can write like this. Now we need to discuss some commonly used notation. In the general case, we might speak of the probability that the random variable x takes on the value little x. Here capital X represents the random variable, and lowercase x represents a value of the random variable. We often use a simpler notation, p of little x, which means the same thing. That's just short form for the probability the random variable x equals little x. And in this table, we might change the notation from value of x and probability to little x and p of little x. If you find this uppercase, lowercase x notation confusing, try not to worry too much about it. In most situations, it's not a major point of confusion. 
all discrete probability distributions must satisfy these two conditions. First, all of the probabilities must lie between 0 and 1. As a general rule, we know that probabilities must be between 0 and 1. And the sum of all probabilities must equal 1. We are listing all possible values of x, so the sum of those probabilities must equal 1. One of those values must occur. And if we take a look at the probability distribution for the example, we see that those conditions are in fact satisfied. All three probabilities lie between 0 and 1, and they add to 1. Here we've listed out the probability distribution in a table, but we might display it in other ways. For example, we might plot it in a probability histogram. Let's take a look at that. Here is a probability histogram, illustrating the distribution of the random variable x for the example. We have the values of x along the x-axis, and the probabilities of them occurring on the y-axis. You might see this plotted in slightly different formats, with thin bars and spaces in between them. But I typically plot it in this fashion. I'm going to compare this discrete probability distribution for our discrete random variable x with a probability distribution for a continuous random variable. This is, approximately, the probability distribution of the height of a randomly selected adult Canadian male, which is a continuous random variable. And we model continuous random variables with a smooth curve. For discrete random variables, there are jumps between the different values. In the example, 0 to 1 to 2. For continuous random variables, there is a continuum of possible values, and that is modeled with a smooth curve. So discrete and continuous random variables need to be handled a little differently. One way in which discrete and continuous probability distributions are different is that for continuous random variables, the y-axis does not represent probabilities. Instead, it represents something we call a probability density. We'll talk much more about that later in my videos on continuous probability distributions. So far we've illustrated the distribution of a discrete random variable with a probability histogram or a table. But the table method gets pretty unwieldy if there are many possible values of the random variable. We often represent discrete probability distributions with a formula that helps us to calculate the probabilities. There isn't always going to be a nice simple formula for obtaining the probabilities, but many times there is. For the example, we can use this formula to calculate the probabilities. The probabilities that the random variable x takes on the values 0, 1, and 2 are obtained by substituting those values into this formula. If you don't understand precisely why this is the appropriate formula in this scenario, try not to worry too much about that. I'll discuss that in detail at another time. This formula is called a probability mass function. The probability mass function for a discrete random variable x is a function that yields the probability for each possible value of x. A probability mass function helps us represent the probability distribution in a nice, compact fashion. So a discrete probability distribution might be illustrated with a table, a probability histogram, and or a formula. There are many common types of discrete probability distributions. Distributions that share common characteristics and arise in similar settings. For example, there's the binomial distribution, the hypergeometric distribution, the Poisson distribution, the geometric distribution, and many others. We'll talk about all of these distributions on another day.